So Genevieve, tell me more about it. So actually, I was born in Haiti in a family there that said my mom always said you can be whatever you want. Love her. And so I never felt that in my career that I didn't get a job because I wasn't good enough. It's just I didn't want it bad enough. So I actually grew up in Haiti till the age of 13. We moved to the U.S. So I have two sisters. My middle sister is an engineer, civil engineer. Nice. And the younger one studied first life sciences, and now she works in special ed. I studied biochemistry. So we wow. all went to the you know, university, here, and I love traveling. I've been traveling to India now for almost 25 years. Oh, my God. I can rock the sari. <laughs> I've spent a lot of time in India. Why did you go to India so often? I first started with the fact that I was working for Hewlett Packard. And nice. the way it ended up is also one of the year of SARS, I was supposed to go to China. And I couldn't go to China. And my girlfriend, her brother-in-law was getting married. So I went to my first full Punjabi wedding. Fantastic. There's no wedding like an Indian wedding. Great thing is good food. Good food. Some of the best, best friend food you'll ever have. Fabulous food. Yes, sir. It's such a foodie place. I am a foodie. I know all my food in Hindi. <laughs> <laughs> well done. So, so 25 times to India? 25, no, no, 25 years. Wow. <laughs> So, I love you for it. Actually, I did something very crazy. I used to work for RBS. It was during the Olympics. It was very expensive to get housing. So I was having SAP work for me. And I said, okay, we're picking up, shifting everybody to India. And I moved the team of about 60 from London to India. Wow. <laughs> That's bold. <laughs> and you got to do it. But it saved us money. And actually, it made it so much better because we worked all together. We partied all together. Yeah. And you live in the UK now? I live in Jersey, in the Channel Island. Oh, so why in Jersey? Jersey? It's a tiny place. My husband is Jersey, and it's a great thing. I can leave him home, and I can run around. <laughs> so we have actually just downsized so that we can, he can travel with me. Yeah. Because part of the challenge is when you're doing your startup. I was going to come to that. <laughs> How did you move from healthcare to MTV to financial industry? Just curiosity. Amazing. I started my career with this idea two years. And two years you learn and then you move on. And I actually like to hire people who haven't worked exactly in what I'm trying to do because you bring in a fresh perspective and it helps in shaping answers that you may not actually have yourself. So healthcare is because I'm an immigrant. Yeah. You're intelligent, you're gonna go to med school. Yeah. And I'm like, eh, I'm not going to med school. And then I ended up working in literary laboratories, getting into technology and understanding that I had an ability to actually transcend for the technologies and the business wow how to go about. And I realized in the last few months, I've been doing a lot of thinking, that I was a change agent. I was seeing things that people didn't see. Hmm. But it's not enough to see it. Yeah. Because a lot of people see, yeah. but they can't communicate. Yeah. So being able to understand how to communicate and to get everyone to embrace at all level yeah. the organization is very important. And actually, you'll probably love this. Yesterday I was talking to someone who was talking about, because I believe there's a new way. We're coming into new ways of working. Absolutely. Where individual needs to be empowered. And, you know, if you look at the U.S., where half of the population of the millennium already are working as temporary workers. Yeah. So how do you actually get these people into leadership? And what I said is what's missing is human resources. You know, sometimes we're very negative about what human resource brings in. You know, so how do you in an organization, a small organization, make the choice of the right individual and when there is conflict now in a startup, when there's conflict, you go to legal. We're focusing too much on the hiring process rather than on the development of the people. Exactly. But also when there is conflict yes. in the organization, yes. how do you create mediation? It's a fantastic point. But you changing gears a little bit, Jambi. Can you help explain what is blockchain and in the context of digital currency? So blockchain is not new. It actually is the same technology which uses the identity, which is X509. So the way I sometimes say is like a spreadsheet in the sky, but with trust. So really it's internet with trust, it's databases. But a database that when you write the information, it doesn't write it in one place. 
It writes it in many places. And because it's a digital where you need to have a private and a public key, you can then now start also thinking just mathematical, that you can split things into umpteen little fractionalization which then allows you to have a valuation to it. So what has happened is in the last few years, so the Bitcoin, I mean, today I was actually, I called the bank because I sent some money two weeks ago. They can't find the money. So I called the bank and I said, can we do a tracer? I said, well, if you do a tracer, it's going to be 20 pounds. I said, give me the MT3, uh, 103 to send. If it was Bitcoin, I know it's received, then nobody in the middle. It's information. So that information becomes currency. Mm-hmm. And so the technology itself is very interesting. And however, because you can create value, you can take this cup and now split it in a thousand pieces and have a thousand people actually believe in buying it. That's where we ended up. I was reading the other day and apparently in the 1500s, it was a sugar coin. So the UK didn't want to send to the Americas, to Caribbean, any silver. So actually people bought made from the sugar, not with the coin of sugar, but the value of the sugar was an exchange yeah. mechanism. But it was a trading system. It was a valuation, which then was equal to a certain amount. So therefore, you basically used it as a currency to actually sell your goods. So I'd give you the sugar, and then when the silver came in, that was your valuation. So that's really what this is about. And to me, what's most important about it is really the trust that it creates. Mm. So one of the things we were talking about is mediation. So in the project I'm doing, we're actually creating the mechanism for conflict to be resolved by the Board of Arbitration, by them being able to have that information. So what we're delivering for Haiti is somewhat of a complex system. It's not complex, but some of the complexities in there is because we're measuring throughout the process is the temperature being kept, is the quality what's needed. When you do the quality inspection, is there something wrong? Whose fault is it? And whoever's fault it is results in a sort of penalty. So if the farmer has a bad product and it's gone all the way to the factory, the factory can actually put a debit against it to say we've done the work Now, it's not a good product. We had checked it at the farm gate, and we still have a problem. So therefore, there is a penalty for that. But let's just say they were going from the farm gate to the factory. They have a certain amount of time they have to reach. If they breach that timing, then the goods are no longer violent. Now, let's just say the reason for that was an act of God. There was a flooding, or there was a false measure. They couldn't get past the road. Those things, before they get actually penalty, would go to the arbitration board to say, yes, there was something. So you now start having events which are validated. Great thing about having the arbitration board involved is that it gets law by design, Mm. and it removes the stress of people to have to go, because you have to stop your work to go and find So now you continue your work and you know there's a fair system and the data will be what shows the truth. That's the trust layer. That's the trust layer. Great thought. Great thought. And how do you see your business evolving? What comes next? I started it around food because I'm a foodie. (laughs) Haven't met food yet. I don't like, but I don't do weird stuff. I'm not into uh, worms and things like that. No. 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 Are you vegan? Not yet. No, no, no. no. Are you you vegan? I eat everything. And I think the impacts your environment. I think everything in moderation yes. is I think it's having a balance. It's the whole thing is a balance, yeah. So I started, when I uncovered the blockchain, it was like, ah, oh, wow, a system which allows straight through processing because everything doesn't need to be checked and be checked. So if I send you something, you receive it, it's marked that you received it, and I have a copy that you received it. We don't need somebody to come in and check that it really happened because the system is demonstrating that we can't change it. So therefore, it becomes a truth. Or when it's about also opinion, You'll have your opinion of my, my opinions. That's all marked. It's all captured. And then through the consensus, it then is decided which opinion it becomes the truth. And if one of us changes our mind later, that can also be captured. So which means that you have a point in time when all that information is being done, but no one can actually take it away. You can just append more detail to it. Which means that from a governance standpoint, it's much easier. So actually what the World Bank wants us to do in Haiti is two beautiful things. One, it's creating entrepreneurs out of the farmers because we allow them to retain ownership of the good further down 
mm. the, the value chain. Fundamentally, a lot of time, they sell early in order to get the cash because they need it for their working capital, for children's school, and all of that. Now, the Haiti example is it's about 5 to 10 cents a kilo mm. that they receive. And sometimes it's really bad. Somebody will come and say, I'll take this tree. Then they come and they have the tree. They get the fruit from the tree and then they bring it to the U.S. That fruit in the U.S. at the wholesale market sells between three to seven a kilo. So if you're looking at the differential, the farmer gets 2% of the foreign market. Now, on the local market, the price is between 50 to 70 cents. So it's much more equitable if it's getting five to 10 cents. But the fundamental problem is that in order to actually get the whole country moving, if something is wanted outside, or if we look at it, it's mostly the developing countries who are now producing our fresh fruits. So how do we get it afar and also understand what the costs are and make sure that the farmer actually gets a better share? So what we're doing with AgriLedger is the World Bank actually hired the service providers. They get paid for coming and picking it up, preparing it, boxing it, getting it to the state, and storing it. And then the actual broker doesn't work for them. The broker works for the farmer. Mm -hmm. So it's in his best interest to get the best price, and he'll get 10% of the sale. So what we've looked at is just taking $3. We're looking to where the farmer will get anywhere from $80 to $1.10. Wow. On three dollars. Wow. And so now one of the challenges is the supermarkets they don't want to pay right away, they have the forty five days, sixty days. So we flipped it actually in that I have an invoice and receivable due from the supermarket. I take that and I go to a factoring company and I say, What are you gonna give me for this? Nice. So we're working with a factoring company who wants to be able to do that. Now, what you're doing is you're doing the credit risk to the supermarket, not to the farmer. And you're providing credit to these people. Mm -hmm. You're shifting accountability. Mm -hmm. You're shifting the risk. We don't think about what's going on in the middle and all the risks and all the failure and the quality issues that may be, which are people are in a supermarket and also the middlemen are trying to balance. Mm -hmm. So what we're looking to do is really create entrepreneurs out of the farmers. They have to produce a quality, not quantity, quality good to be able to get it to market. And if you get quality good to market, then you're rewarded for it. And they understand that because they know what the external market is. It's just that they don't have access to it. No one is coming to pick it up. We're expecting about 1,400 farmers. So the government, and this is something also, they're being registered by the government. One of the things that I believe is very important to do is to provide privacy and data privacy and dignity through that. So the system I'm designing is looking to use identity management. So the government does the identity management, but I also look to protect them through their financial uh, dealing. And we're working with IoT to provide them an offline identity. And then through that, their data is actually their data. Mm -hmm. If that data is used for other purposes, which is actually one of the things that we look to do. So everybody is doing the traceability and showing oh, this came from this farmer over there. But we're not only going to show that it came from the farmer. With the supermarkets, we're going to be working with them to show how much went throughout the chain. So you can now understand your carbon footprint for the product. And also of that, how much is actually going back to the farmer. Mm -hmm. The other thing about it also is that because of the process, we're also guaranteed that anything which has to do with food security and food safety will actually be met. And nothing that does not meet it will actually get to your hand. So all that data is data that we'll keep to then be able to demonstrate there is a process for taking out what is not good on the system. What is your purpose? My purpose is to enable others to have an opportunity to reach, I don't want to say the sky because we don't always want the sky, but the ability to be able to be who you are. And what I see is if we're able to successfully do this, it's not the farmer, it's his child who's going to have a choice. So choice to me is something that's very important. Also, it should be a choice that I want to stay where I am. You know, I mean, I've been a nomad my life. I travel a lot and I love it. But not everybody wants to leave their 20-mile radius. And opportunities do not usually come to that. And with technology nowadays, we can bring that. What blockchain does is because it's about trust, we can now be at very far distance 
and transact with one another. And that's what the Bitcoin does. Without fear of me withholding information. And you send me the information now, I don't send it to you. So there is that trust that happens. But then we can use other things such as machine learning, analytics, to then be able to teach people. So one of the things that we're doing in Haiti also is if the farmer brings in a lot and more than 10% is rejected, that triggers that he needs education. What has actually gone wrong with what's bad, which was rejected? And then someone has to go see him within the week to speak with him and to tell him how to do it better. So we can create opportunity for education and for betterment of people. It's not about making them feel bad, but it's giving them the tools to be able to be more successful. What an amazing achievement, personally, but also what an amazing achievement, creating something that can empower those who could have been left behind with all the changes that happened. I would yeah. love to take that. I think that in reality, the person, this gentleman, Emiliano Dutch from the World Bank, is really the one who's had the vision. You now, I've been talking about it, how yeah. to implement it on the side. I've yeah. been talking about this is what I want to do. And he's been creating the yeah. microcosm, yeah. and it was perfect. For me, technology should be where the individual understands what it's going to do for them, rather than you come in and you push it and you hope it's going to work for them. My last question. You're such an embodiment for lifelong learning. How does one learn new skills at the pace that you're learning? You make yourself open. I actually take an hour in the morning religiously, and if I don't have time for some reason, I'll do more on the weekend. Did you just research, read very quickly. It doesn't need you don't need to read the whole article. Yeah. You just get to the point. I think you always have to keep learning, and everybody thirsts for learning. It's just sometimes the opportunities are not given or you know what it's one of the things teaching someone how to learn is more important than teaching them something it's a great thought teaching them how to fish rather than fishing exactly Mm -hmm. exactly so I don't know if you know with Haiti I first wanted to give them cell phones I wanted to give them a smartphone but after spending one day where I forgot to charge my phone because it was 18 hours without electricity and my phone died I realized well I have electricity couldn't charge now I have no communication imagine someone who does not have electricity in their house who has to walk a mile to get a phone charge you yeah. can't do that Just so solutions. what i hope is we will build the well to where they will start asking for the infrastructure and looking to have that infrastructure for themselves the social yeah. enterprise to it is really bringing people together Fantastic. to understand that possibility no one has been given anything everyone has been given a possibility fabulously expressed great stuff